Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the UC Berkeley uh, CEDAR seminar. Uh, I'm Lisa Goldberg, CEDAR's co-director, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, a longtime CEDAR uh, member, uh, Samim Gamami, who is now uh, at the SEC talking to us about uh, risk of central counterparties. Cool title, skin in the, ga skin in the game. So, uh, Samim, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate it. It's great to be um, here again virtually. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Hi, everyone. Uh, um, as Lisa mentioned, uh, the title of the presentation is Skin the Game Risk Analysis of CCPs. It's based on a, a June work with Roma Kant. Uh, and uh, just before I start, uh, uh, I'm just expressing my own views, not uh, my colleagues at the SEC. So let me... Okay. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, I mean, I assume that you are... Uh, familiar with the basics of uh, central clearing and CCPs. If not, please interrupt me and ask questions uh, whenever you would like to do so. Uh, I would first provide some uh, quick background on central clearing. Uh, then I'll uh, sketch the uh, uh, proposal and main uh, results of the paper. And uh, toward the end, uh, I would outline the analytical framework and uh, the modeling approach uh, for designing uh, uh, CCP's capital contribution to the default waterfall, which is often referred to as uh, skin in the game. So going back to background on central clearing, um, as you may know, uh, central clearing of standardized OTC derivatives uh, uh, has been one of the main uh, components of the uh, OTC derivatives market reform program after the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Uh, similarly, uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, disruptions uh, around March uh, 2020 uh, in secondary part of the US treasury markets. Uh, it was in part due to uh, constraints on uh, uh, intermediaries balance sheet, uh, large, essentially large uh, bank dealers balance sheet, uh, uh, for intermediating these markets. And following that, uh, we have seen reform programs uh, by the G30 for uh, the secondary uh, US Treasury market, both the cash part of the market and the repo part of the market. And as you may know, broader central clearing mandates uh, uh, in this market uh, has become one of the main uh, elements of the G30 reform program. Um, uh, you might be familiar with the potential benefits of central clearing. Um, uh, the well-known uh, immediate ones are that central clearing could reduce interconnectedness in the financial system. It may improve transparency. If some conditions are met, uh, central clearing may also uh, mitigate counterparty credit risk. Those conditions have been laid out in papers, well-known papers by Duffy Zhu, uh, Rahman, his co-author, Colum. Uh, some of the conditions have also been outlined in, in my paper with Paul Glasserman. And uh, I mean, he, uh, yes, I forgot to ask. Okay, to interrupt as we go along with questions. Sure, or, absolutely. Or yes. So, sure. can you say a little bit about why reduction of interconnectedness uh, is good? Does this prevent shocks from propagating, or or? Uh, uh, it, uh, in my personal view, uh, not necessarily. It's not necessarily good from uh, the perspective of uh, absorbing uh, shocks. It's because I think uh, reducing interconnectedness goes hand to hand with increasing transparency. I think if uh, the system is uh, very complex in terms of nodes in the financial system, uh then uh, we can't have uh, i mean the official sector policymakers regulators cannot uh really see through the system and that was actually the case uh, uh during march 2020 so one of the things that the official sector has taken on since then has been uh, trying to collect uh data on for example uh, bilateral repo markets just to understand the nature of this market. So I think 
uh, reducing interconnectedness would increase transparency. I see. So the purpose of the fir the f first thing is the second thing. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so I just mentioned that uh, if some conditions are met, uh, counterparty credit risk may also be reduced. I mean, here I would just note that um, in uh, short term uh, part of the both cash market and the repo market, most of the times central clearing would be materialized in the form of settlement risk and settlement failures. And here I've also cited a recent paper by researchers at the Bank of England showing that indeed if that's if multilateral netting through CCPs dominates uh, bilateral netting, uh, then uh, we may see some reduction uh, on uh, constraints uh, on uh, intermediaries balance sheet. So they can better intermediate uh, cash and repo treasury markets. Um, so, um, I mean, clearly because CCPs would um, pool uh, counterparty credit risk and would concentrate counterparty credit risk, they need to be subject to effective governance, regulatory oversight. They need to have robust risk management practices. I mean, it's interesting to note that the right design and regulation of CCPs, I mean, uh, continue to generate debate among uh, the private sector participants, official sector and policymakers. Here, uh, as one example, uh, I mean, uh, I would refer you to uh, uh, 2019 2020 industry paper where major US buy side and sell side firms call for regulatory action to make clearing houses safer. One particular recommendation there was asking CCPs to contribute more to the default waterfall. I'll mention shortly what, what, what default waterfall is uh, at two tranches. So uh, this research, this paper has been motivated in part by how we can design these two tranches or uh, the skin in the game. So uh, what is a multi-layer default waterfall? Um, as you may know, CCPs uh, rely on their financial uh, resources to remain resilient. So these financial resources are structured in different layers uh, at uh, large derivative CCPs, for example, a clearing members would contribute uh, to the pool of initial margin at the CCP. They make contributions to the pre-funded default fund uh, of the CCP. And uh, when a clearing member defaults, the defaulter pay resources would come into play first. And these are the initial margin and the pre-funded default fund contribution of the defaulting member. The next layer to cover the potential remaining losses is uh, CCP's uh, own capital contribution to the default waterfall skin in the game here denoted by S. Next, we have uh, uh, surviving members pre-funded default fund resources. So if losses would exceed uh, the defaulter's initial margin pre-funded default fund and first layer of skin in the game, then losses would be mutualized and allocated to surviving members pre-funded default fund after that, we have the second layer of skin in the game, denoted by S tilde. This is the second capital contribution of the CCP to the default waterfall. After that, the CCP can go back to surviving members and ask for more contribution to the default fund. That is often uh, referred to as the unfunded uh, default fund. And uh, we have other recovery and mechanisms at the very end. Uh, I won't go through the details unless if you're interested to know or if you have questions. One example is variation margin uh, haircutting. So to, just to recap, uh, the defaulter's initial margin comes first, then the pre-funded default fund contribution of the defaulter, then S, the first layer of skin in the game, Surviving members pre-funded default fund contribution, S tilde, the second layer of skin in the game, unfunded uh, default fund, uh, and then we have other uh, recovery resolution mechanisms. So one interesting case that we also analyze in this project is what I call uh, the monolayer default waterfall. 
So uh, it turns out that at the uh, largest systemically important security CCPs uh, in the US, for example, DTCC and its subsidiaries, it is the pool of initial margin that gets uh, mutualized uh, uh, after the first layer of skin in the game among surviving members. This happens because there is no additional layer of pre-funded default fund. So we only have the pool of initial margin and that is used for loss mutualization uh, along the way. So why uh, this case is important because uh, under the broader central clearing mandate, a particular subsidiary of the DTCC, FIC, the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, uh, may essentially be uh, uh, the CCP for the secondary part of, uh, for the, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, the secondary U.S. Treasury uh, markets, both the cash part and the and the repo part. Can, sorry, so, I mean, can, can you yes. say what mutualization means? I don't know the term. Uh, so, essentially, it means sharing uh, the remaining losses among uh, surviving members by allocating these losses to their uh, uh, pre-funded default fund contribution. And uh, that is often referred to as loss mutualization. But essentially, it's sharing the losses and allocating it to surviving members. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and uh, so, so this uh, subsidiary, Miss DTCC, and all its subsidiaries operate under the so-called monolayer default waterfall, and FIC is likely to become the CCP. Uh, to clear uh, almost all parts of the uh, 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 treasury market, both the cash part and the repo part. So it makes sense to analyze the monolayer default waterfall as well. Uh, what is the goal of the paper? Uh, here, uh, I mentioned two uh, uh, recent uh, sur CCP surveys. Uh, uh, these surveys, along with uh, many other uh, uh, papers, uh, commentaries, and etc., that came since a few years ago when CCPs were asked by the regulators to make information on the, the default water for public, show uh, essentially three things. One, uh, that skin in the game is often a very small fraction of member pre-funded resources. For example, at the largest CCP in the UK, LCH, uh, skin in the game or the capital contribution of the C LCH to its default, fall, default waterfall is 1% uh, of the default fund. Second, uh, skin in the game varies widely across CCPs. Third, uh, policymakers, regulators don't have a quantitative methodology to specify skin in the game and uh, to evaluate its sufficiency. So the goal of this research has been to address these, uh, these shortcomings. Um, if you're familiar with bank capital uh, regulation, it, it would be also interesting to contrast the rules-based bank capital uh, regulation with principles-based CCP regulation each would have its pros and cons, but uh, I personally think one disadvantage of the CCP regulation, which is principles-based, is that sometimes uh, 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 we may not see any correspondence between uh, skin in the game, the capital contribution of the CCP to the default waterfall with the risk profile of the CCP. So one goal of the paper is to propose a risk-based design and formulation for, for skin in the game. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, I mean, agency problems are everywhere in uh, uh, OTC markets, in over-the-counter markets. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, central clearing, uh, if we view CCPs as uh, uh, essentially sent uh, counterparty credit risk insurance providers, then uh, the classical moral hazard problem here would be that members uh, may take excessive risk, counterparty credit risk, and this could be mitigated by uh, the CCP asking members 
to uh, uh, pay collateral, uh, mostly in the form of initial margin. It can also be mitigated by having well-designed uh, uh, loss mutualization schemes in place. Uh, a second form of uh, moral hazard problem uh, may appear when uh, you take this extreme case that, that what if a CCP wouldn't have any skin in the game, wouldn't make any capital contribution to the default waterfall, then uh, the CCP may not be incentivized to monitor counterparty credit risk in the system because uh, losses after the default paid resources would all be mutualized and shared and allocated to surviving members. So this second form of moral hazard problem uh, uh, can be mitigated by, a, by having a well-designed uh, skin in the game. Um, so most of the CCPs are uh, investor-owned. There are some member-owned CCPs as well, for instance, DTCC and its subsidiaries. And this second form of moral hazard problem can become a bit uh, subtle when we want to uh, analyze uh, what I call risk management agency problems at member-owned CCPs. So here uh, we draw uh, from the work of uh, Hart and Moore and Hansman uh, to show that even at member-owned CCPs, uh, the CCP, uh, CCP managers, I would call them CCP managers, may not be sufficiently incentivized to have uh, adequate levels of capital contribution uh, to the default waterfall. And this can happen particularly at CCPs with heterogeneous membership, which is often the case at systemically important CCPs. So along the way, uh, we argue by using the work of Hart and Moore and Hansman that uh, the results uh, would also be applicable to a member owned CCPs. A sketch of the proposal and summary of the findings. Uh, so uh, the logic is uh, simple. Uh, uh, we make this observation and show that conditional uh, on a member's default when the CCP makes zero capital contribution to the default waterfall. So first consider the first layer of the skin in the game. When S is zero, uh, survive the loss from the perspective of uh, surviving members would exceed the loss, uh, the comparable loss from the perspective of the CCP. So we quantify these member loss probabilities, contrast them with the CCP loss probability when S is zero. And uh, when we see that member loss probabilities always exceed CCP, the CCP loss probability, we say that's a way to quantify the second form of moral hazard problem. Based on these uh, loss probabilities, then we develop incentive compatibility constraints and we show how skin in the game can be specified to satisfy a subset of these incentive compatibility constraints. So in its simplest form, S or first layer of skin in the game uh, turns out to be uh, a fraction of uh, uh, the pre-funded default fund. The pre-funded default fund is denoted by D. It is to be more specific, one minus C1 times uh, the pre-funded default fund. C1 is uh, what I call concentration ratio. And that is the ratio of uh, the CCP's largest tail exposure to uh, the aggregate uh, tail exposure at the CCP. What is the tail exposure? Uh, suppose that we have a way to model and calculate uh, CCP's exposure uh, to each member conditional on that member's default uh, uh, in extreme uh, but plausible market scenarios. I'll elaborate that elaborate on that along the way. So we quantify these tail exposures and suppose for simplicity that member one uh, uh, would generate the uh, largest tail exposure from CCP's perspective. And suppose that we have uh, capital N members, uh, we have ordered them, the, N, the last member would generate the smallest expo tail exposure from CCP's perspective. So C1 would be the largest exposure divided by the sum. We show that 
when S is formulated like this, some of the basic incentive compatibility constraints that we have put in place uh, will be satisfied. The logic is similar for the second layer of skin in the game. So the first layer of skin in the game, uh, uh, we view this as a buffer against uh, losses to surviving members pre-funded default fund. The second la layer of skin in the game or S tilde, we view this as a buffer against losses to members uh, unfunded default fund. From now on, the logic is similar in the sense that we make this observation that when S tilde is zero, uh, uh, members, member loss probabilities will exceed the CCP loss probability. So that's a way to quantify the second form of moral hazard problem for the second layer of skin in the game. Then this give, would give us a way to set up uh, 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 incentive compatibility constraints. We formulate STDA to satisfy these incentive compatibility constraints. It turns out that STDA, similar to S, will, can also be expressed as a fraction of the pre-funded default fund. Now, in its most general form, the, uh, uh, SE, uh, the skin in the game design framework uh, uses uh, the threshold exceedances approach from extreme value theory uh, in the following way. We model the conditional loss distribution when we conditioning on, when we condition on losses exceeding the initial margin by the Pareto distribution. I will along the way mention that why uh, I think we think uh, this assumption uh, uh, is a natural assumption to make. Uh, intuitively, the reason is uh, initial margin is set at very high confidence levels. And uh, we know from some uh, uh, extreme value theory results that uh, when uh, the threshold, uh, go, uh, when the level of threshold goes up, uh, in the limit, uh, in our case, the conditional loss uh, distribution will indeed uh, converge to the generalized Pareto distribution. But we say in the heavy tail case, the generalized Pareto distribution becomes a Pareto distribution. And that's the logic behind ma making this Pareto assumption. Uh, to jump uh, to the main result of the paper is that uh, we have this frame analytical framework. We do uh, uh, we carry out some numerical studies, and the conclusion is that skin in the game uh, below fifteen to twenty percent of the pre-funded default fund cannot be produced in the uh, realistic uh, part of the parameter space. Yeah, so I mean, and that. Sure. Uh, ask a question on the previous slide. So <laughs> if you're going to use one of these Pareto distributions, it maybe has like a power law exponent that you have to That's estimate. Right. That's Do right. you have adequate data to guess what that power law might be? Uh, so for example, for uh, I will show that along the way, Lisa, thank you. That's a very good question. So the tail exponent, uh, to be very, very specific, the tail exponent of the Pareto distribution, we know from prior empirical studies that for different asset classes from equity to uh, credit derivatives would vary between uh, uh, two to four to be very specific. And in the numerical study that I mentioned at the end, it, it can be viewed essentially as a sensitivity analysis. Mm -hmm. So uh, we play with uh, different parameters of the Pareto distribution. That's, that, that's a sensitivity type analysis. But for the rest of the model parameters, for example, the confidence level associated with initial margin, confidence level associated with the pre-funded default fund, these are all set by the regulators. For example, at systemically important CCPs, the confidence level associated with initial margin should be 99% uh, or more. So for the rest, the parameters are given by the regulators. Yeah. Well, if you're setting a parameter as high as 99%, I think I know what that means. They're couldn't be very much data out in the tail unless you have a huge sample in order to figure out what that exponent is like. Uh, that's right. But interestingly, uh, and we discussed this along the way, because the way that uh, the pre-funded default fund is sized, uh, 
all the systemic systemically important CCPs globally uh, are required to disclose these uh, their tail exposure. They are required to disclose their tail exposure because this is how they size uh, their pre-funded default fund. So yes, it's difficult to model, it's difficult to measure, but public data is available on it. Great, thank you. Uh, so going back to, uh, so just, just to conclude with regard to the summary of our findings, uh, when we contrast monolayer CCPs to multilayer CCPs, uh, I mean, we can use the same uh, analytical uh, incentive compatibility-based framework, uh, which essentially results in uh, that a monolayer CCP should allocate more capital to the default waterfall. And the reason behind that is intuitive. In practice, total initial margin can be 10 times or more larger than the pre-funded default fund. And uh, as you may recall, I mentioned that in a monolayer CCP, it is the pool of initial margin that gets mutualized for loss allocation. And uh, so essentially members are more, surviving members are more exposed to losses to their initial margin. And because of that, the CCP would need to uh, allocate more capital to the uh, pre-funded default fund. And we have a formulation for this comparison as well. I will mention that along the way. Uh, back to uh, DTCC and subsidiaries, particularly FIC, similar to LCH, uh, there are results showing that at FIC, also the capital contribution is less than 1% of members' uh, pre-funded uh, resources. Uh, the paper has also some results for how this framework may be used uh, to improve uh, uh, bank capital regulation for their exposure to CCPs. Uh, in, in the interest of time, I would uh, skip this part of the analysis. So now, uh, uh, please let me uh, just outline uh, the modeling framework. Uh, let me start by... Uh, mentioning how we uh, formulate the tail exposure. So, so suppose that a CCP bears one particular asset class among uh, uh, N um, direct clearing members indexed by I, and uh, let's say UI represents the exposure, exposure of the CCP to member I's default over a risk horizon. This risk horizon is often referred to as margin period of risk, in systemically important securities, CCPs, like DTCC, it's often one to two days. Systemically important derivative CCPs, it could uh, go to four uh, to five days. UI essentially captures the portfolio value change over this MPOR mm, between the CCP and uh, member I. Initial margin contribution of member I is denoted by MI. It's essentially a quantile of this random variable UI at a given confidence level denoted by uh, one minus Q. So we can think of Q as the loss probability associated with initial margin. I mentioned tail exposure. So tail exposures would come into play when we model and calculate CCP's exposure to member I net initial margin. So these are, in fact, residual tail exposures. And I mentioned in extreme but plausible uh, market scenarios, and this is the language exactly taken from uh, uh, CCP, uh, CCP regulation, uh, CCP regulatory uh, guidelines. So essentially what happens in practice is that to, as I will mention shortly, to size up this pre-funded default fund, CCPs, I would calculate, would model and calculate uh, the value at risk, for example, a risk measure associated with the positive part of this random variable, UI minus MI, at a confidence level, one minus QD. So QD is the loss probability associated with the pre-funded default one. And I mean, obviously QD is less than a Q. The total pre-funded default fund, as I mentioned earlier, is denoted by D, and the contribution of member I to the pre-funded default fund is uh, denoted by DI. Uh, 
Now, why, why talking about these tail exposures? Because uh, regulatory guidelines ask CCPs to specify and size the pre-funded default fund conditional on uh, one the largest member default for uh, uh, systemically important security CCPs, conditional on the simultaneous default of two members for systemically important derivative CCPs. So in the so-called cover one case, D, the total default fund is uh, E1. Let's say for simplicity, we order these tail exposures and member one creates the largest tail exposure. So in the cover two case, the pre-funded default fund is E1 uh, plus E2. And how this total default fund would be allocated to members to specify their contribution to the default fund, it's often pro proportional to these tail exposures. So the contribution of member I to the pre-funded the pool of pre-funded default fund is proportional to its tail exposure. Now, uh, let me uh, go back to uh, 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 incentives of a member uh, investor-owned CCPs to make capital contribution to the default waterfall. Uh, uh, different researchers uh, have come up with uh, different ways to analyze uh, CCP's incentives to make capital contribution to the default waterfall. Here, uh, uh, we, we have a very stylized way, a very stylized, simple way um, uh, to show that uh, indeed uh, investor-owned CCPs may not be incentivized to make any capital contribution to the default waterfall. How can we... Uh, discuss this uh, in an analytical way is by considering the loss from CCP's perspective conditional on a member's default. Suppose that that member is member J. And this loss from CCP's perspective would come into place uh, twice. One, uh, up to uh, the defaulter pay resources. And two, uh, 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 after all members pre-funded resources. This, the first part is essentially the minimum of uh, S and UJ minus MJ minus DJ, the, the, the positive part of that. And obviously the second part is the minimum of the second layer, S tilde, and the loss that would exceed all pre-funded resources, both the defaulted resources and the uh, surviving member uh, pre-funded uh, default fund contributions. So that, that's the loss from CCP's perspective. Now let's say one very stylized way to approximate the expected net profit uh, at a, a representative CCP would be saying that, okay, suppose that V is the clearing average clearing volume over a, a period of time and phi is the clearing fee. So phi V would, represent the gross profit of the CCP, subtract that from that expected loss, that would be the net profit. So the simple elementary idea here is that L can be viewed as an increasing function of S and then S tilde. And because of that left unregulated, investor-owned CCPs may not be incentivized to make capital contribution to the default waterfall, meaning maximizing this expected net profit function all, uh, all else given, initial margin, pre-funded default fund, et cetera, only optimizing over S and S tilde, the CCP itself, it would make S and S tilde equal to zero. So that's, that, that's one way uh, to motivate why, uh, uh, I mean, uh, skinning the game regulation uh, might be desirable. Now, uh, going back to the main modeling framework uh, uh, for, a skin, for the design of a skin in the game, if you remember, uh, I mentioned that the first layer of a skin in the game denoted by S can be viewed uh, as a buffer against losses to surviving members pre-funded default fund. So the first thing that we need to formulate is losses to member I, a surviving member, conditional on the default of member J. So when the losses would, uh, when would the losses reach uh, surviving members 
pre-funded default fund when losses conditional on the default of member J exceed the defaulter pay resources, initial margin of defaulter, pre-funded default fund contribution of the defaulter, and uh, CCP's uh, skin in the game, S. Yes. So this loss would be allocated, would be shared among surviving members, and to member I, proportional to its contribution to the default fund. So that's why you see DI divided by D minus DJ minus DJ because we're conditioning everything on the default of member J. And the mini you have, we have the minimum here because the loss cannot exceed the loss to member I's pre-funded default fund contribution, which is DI cannot exceed DI. Now, when we formulate this loss, we can see that uh, from member I's perspective, the probability that member I's pre-funded default fund would incur a loss is always larger than QD. And if you remember, QD was uh, the loss probability associated with the pre-funded default fund. In other words, one minus QD is the confidence level associated with uh, uh, the default fund. So uh, ha having this in mind, we can uh, formulate comparable loss probability from the CCP's perspective. So LJ0 is the loss to the CCP condition on the default of member J. And here, uh, this inequality in this display uh, that's a way to quantify the second form of moral hazard problem that I mentioned at the beginning. So this display, essentially what it says is that the probability that a member would incur a loss to its pre-funded default fund conditional on the default of member J is always larger than QD, as it's always larger than the comparable loss from CCP's perspective. So this would motivate us to develop this, uh, to set up this incentive compatibility constraint. Meaning we ask the following question, can we formulate S in a way that member loss probabilities would be always less than or equal to QD? So that's the basic incentive compatibility constraint uh, associated with the design of the first layer of skin in the game. Then it turns out that when S is formulated as a fraction of pre-funded default fund, to be more specific as one minus C1 times D, this incentive compatibility co constraint is satisfied. To be more specific, when is, S is formulated like this, we have another incentive compatibility constraint being satisfied, and that is that uh, uh, the CCP and loss, CCP and member loss probabilities conditional on the default of the largest member become perfectly aligned. And this incentive compatibility constraint implies this one under the Pareto assumption. Right. So that's the essentially that's the logic for the core contribution of the paper. First, uh, quantifying the second form of moral hazard problem. That was step one. Step two, uh, setting up this basic incentive compatibility uh, uh, constraint. Uh, and the next step was, uh, I mean, uh, figuring out. Uh, what type of S can satisfy this incentive compatibility constraint. And as a corollary, we have uh, the perfect alignment of the largest counterparty default loss probabilities. So for the second, to design the second layer of a skin in the game, the logic is exactly similar, but uh, please remember that the second layer is still the, can be viewed as a buffer against losses to members' unfunded default fund contributions. So we need to formulate the total loss to member I's uh, pre-funded and unfunded default fund contributions conditional on a member's default. And that's the, that's the formulation of it. It's the uh, loss 
to member eyes pre-funded uh, default fund plus the loss to member eyes unfunded default fund. And that's the total loss that would reach the unfunded default fund and it is allocated to member I proportional to its contribution to the uh, pre-funded default fund. And here the assumption that is uh, also, also valid in practice is that the pre-funded default fund is capped by a multiple of the, uh, the unfunded default fund is capped by a multiple of the pre-funded default fund. Uh, so uh, that is often uh, one or two times the pre-funded default fund here, just denoted by beta. Now, the logic is similar. This is the basic incentive compatibility constraint associated with, uh, associated with S tilde. What we want is that member loss probabilities uh, to the uh, losses to the uh, unfunded default fund, these probabilities would be always less than or equal to a target loss probability that, that I call uh, pi tilde. Now, uh, similar to the previous case, uh, you may ask how can we quantify the second form of moral hazard problem for the second layer of skin in the game, the way to quantify that is again by comparing member loss probabilities uh, to loss probabilities from the perspective of the CCP and making this observation that when S tilde is zero, members are always more exposed to losses compared, uh, compared to the CCP. Here, um, so it turns out that when S tilde is beta times one minus C one times D, uh, the basic incentive compatibility constraint is satisfied under the Pareto assumption. Uh, we also have uh, the full alignment of uh, uh, the largest counterparty default loss probabilities from the perspective of the CCP and the members. Now, uh, here, uh, uh, what I've shown is uh, uh, the design of uh, skin in the game. It's in its uh, simplest form, just as a fraction of pre-funded default fund and being a function of the concentration ratio. I mentioned at the beginning that in its most general form, uh, uh, we use the... Uh, we use the Pareto assumption. We use the uh, uh, to to produce the most general form uh, and formulation of S and S tilde. We use the threshold exceedances approach and the and the Pareto assumption. So here uh, our modeling assumption is actually very simple. It is that the conditional distribution of losses when we condition on CCP's exposure to member I exceeding initial margin that essentially follows a Pareto distribution that's a that's the tail exponent of the Pareto distribution alpha and uh, the scale parameter uh, the scale parameter of the Pareto distribution is kappa uh, uh, another uh, related assumption here is that uh, we assume that kappa the scale parameter can vary across members but we have one uh, tail exponent uh, when we make this modeling assumption. Under the Pareto assumption, we can also show that the tail exposures become proportional to the shape parameter of the Pareto distribution. Um, Sami, can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, Bajo. Yeah, hi. Uh, <laughs> good to it's see you. Long, yeah, good to see you. Long time not see you. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm enjoying your, your talk very much. Thank you. You. Uh, I just have one question about your extreme value theory application. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the extreme value theory uh, typically assumes that the distribution of the extreme values remains stable over time. So in practice, this assumption certainly uh, can be challenging to justify, especially in your financial applications, where the financial regulator regulations or other you know, macroeconomic factors can influence the distribution of the extreme events. So my question is that I, I'm wondering if your analytical framework can incorporate the potentially non-stationary cases for tracking uh, 
uh, how the dependence between extreme values changes over time over uh, or another over another covariate or uh, the change of default risk exposure to the CCP self. So uh, that's my question. Uh, it, it seems like that your numerical results or the theoretical results are based on this extreme value theory, right? So okay. that's my question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Boho. That's a good question. And uh, I think uh, at the beginning, that's why I mentioned a modern approach, or maybe not in the slides in the paper, a modern approach to extreme value theory. In fact, you, if you look at uh, early papers on threshold exceedances approach, uh, it may not even, I think, have anything to do with the classical results on extreme value theory and the stability of extreme values, like you mentioned. So here, the in the threshold exceedances approach, the limiting result is that when this guy, when the in our setting, when uh, initial margin gets large enough, this conditional distribution in the limit becomes the generalized Pareto distribution, mm -hmm. right? And here we make another simplifying assumption that we can work directly with the generalized Pareto distribution, but why do we work with the Pareto distribution? Because the generalized Pareto distribution in the heavy tail case is indeed the Pareto distribution, right? So here we don't run into uh, what you just mentioned that is indeed valid in the classical extreme value theory results. Here, uh, one objection could be that, okay, mm, initial margin, even at a 99% confidence level is, is not large enough, right? So that, that, uh, that could be an objection. But we think, uh, I mean, uh, we think this assumption is justified because uh, initial margin is is very uh, as uh, I show you some numerical examples is is really really large. Okay, thank you very much. Just just to mention that it is well known that the central clearance system may concentrate the tail risk in the systemic sense if the CCP maybe fails to establish a well managed risk management practices. So uh, in your case, uh, I understand your point, but you know in general the exposure to the CCP. Uh, it's going to be very important as, as a result of the new policy uh, implications. So that's, that's the, the point of my question. Anyways, thank you very much for your response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, so now uh, let me, uh, so here my goal uh, in this slide is just to outline uh, how we derive uh, uh, the most, I mean, the general form uh, of the uh, skin in the game, S. So under the uh, uh, Pareto assumption, because of us using the threshold exceedances approach, member loss uh, probability distribution function, also the CCP loss probability distribution function, would take this convenient analytical form that you see on the right side of this equation. And from this, uh, if we set a target loss probability uh, for members, so for example, suppose that uh, the target loss probability is uh, the probability that member I would take a loss to his pre-funded default fund conditional on the default of the largest member. Suppose that that loss probability is given and that's, that is set by us, by the regulators, and that's pi, then we can solve for S. You can easily see that from this, uh, uh, this probability distribution function. And then uh, we recover, I mean, we have this general uh, formulation of S, which is again, uh, S being expressed as a fraction or as a percentage of the pre-funded default fund. Uh, here we see again the dependence on the concentration ratio. We see the dependence on the tail exponent of the Pareto distribution. We have the uh, confidence level associated with initial margin set by the regulators, uh, the loss probability or confidence level associated with the pre-funded default fund, again, set by the, by the regulators. And uh, uh, here, essentially, uh, when this target loss probability is set equal to QD, 
which I mentioned at the beginning, then we recover this uh, simple form that, uh, okay, so when this guy is QD, this ratio becomes one, then S is one minus C one times D. Now for the second layer, uh, the logic is similar. Uh, using the Pareto assumption, we have a convenient analytical form for the probability uh, loss distribution function of members and the CCP. Uh, we set a target loss probability for members. This is the loss to the unfunded default fund because we are uh, designing the second layer of skin in the game. So we can solve for S tilde. S tilde also becomes a function of the pre-funded default fund, uh, Q and QD. We have the first member target loss probability, and now the second one, high tilde. So S tilde is specified after we specify the first layer of skin in the game. We playing with this target loss probability uh, pi. And again, going back to, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, the simple formulation of skin in the game, it turns out that when this target loss probability is set equal to the loss from CCP's perspective, conditional on the default of the largest member, then we have this very simple form for uh, S tilde, which is beta times one minus C one times D that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the at the at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and so, so that was the that was the uh, Pareto-based uh, uh, framework uh, for designing S and S tilde. Uh, you saw the general formulation of S and S tilde. When we add them up, we have uh, the total skin in the game. Interestingly, uh, uh, for the total skin in the game, we don't have any explicit dependence on C1, the concentration ratio. So uh, why this total skin in the game is also important because uh, that can be viewed as a lower bound for uh, uh, minimum capital, uh, minimum total capital requirements at the CCP. Right? So this depends on D, the tail exponent of the Pareto distribution, pi tilde, the second target loss probability, uh, the confidence level of initial margin of the pre-funded default fund. And uh, I have one slide in the appendix. Also, there is a table in the paper that when we, uh, when we carry out the numerical studies uh, in the paper, essentially we say we know what the regulatory guidelines tell us about Q and QD. Uh, we know based on um, empirical research what alpha, what the proper range for alpha is for different asset classes. I mentioned between two to four. And uh, we know also roughly uh, the level of uh, pre-funded default fund. And that's how we arrive at this uh, rough result, meaning in the realistic part of the parameter space, skin in the game, total skin in the game cannot be below 15 to 20% of the pre-funded default fund. And now, because in the past few years, there, there is public information on CCP's default waterfall, I mentioned some, uh, some CCP savers earlier in the presentation. Here is also a paper by Huang in 2019. She's at the BIS. Uh, her, her empirical results also suggest that uh, currently skin in the game on average is really a, a, a small percentage of the uh, pre-funded default fund. So average uh, uh, for, I think uh, she uses uh, 2017, uh, 2018 data, averages everything over uh, nine to 10 CCPs globally. Uh, for that time period, uh, skin in the game is around 2.7% of the pre-funded default fund. Now, uh, let me uh, quickly mention the results on uh, monolayer default waterfall. So the same logic and analytical framework can be applied easily to a scenario where we don't have that additional layer of pre-funded default fund when the pool of initial margin uh, uh, is used for uh, uh, the so-called loss mutualization. 
right? So here, uh, uh, L check J zero is lost from CCP's perspective, condition on the default of uh, member J. Uh, this is the uh, uh, loss to member I's initial margin because the initial margin of the surviving member will come into play for loss allocation. This is the loss to that conditional and default of member J. So we formulate this and losses will be allocated to members uh, initial margin, obviously uh, proportional to the initial margin contribution to the pool of initial margin. And uh, we make a few observations. One is when we compare the multi-layer default waterfall with the monolayer default waterfall, I mean, naturally it's very intuitive from the CCP's perspective, losses uh, at multi-layer CCPs are always above losses at uh, the monolayer CCP from the CCP's perspective, right? Because in the monolayer case, uh, pool of IM can be 10 times or more larger than pool of uh, uh, default fund. So CCP is uh, more protected. But how about uh, losses to member surviving members initial margin? In short, how about losses from members perspective? Again, hopefully it is intuitive that members uh, initial margin uh, can take large losses. In fact, conditional on a default of uh, uh, member J, uh, the loss to member I's initial margin is always Q, uh, is always 1% if the confidence level associated with initial margin is 99%. Uh, compare this to losses from the CCP's perspective, this would be way, way below 1% because here we have the pool of initial margin. Now, uh, the same incentive compatibility uh, framework will go through here when we want to compare the monolayer default waterfall with the multi-layer one. So the idea is uh, the idea is to make this observation that if S tilde is equal to M, the total initial margin minus M1, this is the initial margin contribution of the largest member, then we have full alignment when it comes to uh, the largest uh, uh, the largest counterparty default loss probabilities from the perspective of any member, member I, which is a surviving member, and the CCP. So uh, we can also show that uh, when uh, these uh, 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 exposure random variables, uh, the normalized version of these exposure random variables, when they have um, a student dis student distribution with a degree of freedom, let's say, nu, then S tilde can also be expressed uh, using the concentration ratio it will be one minus C one times M. Then everything in terms of the logic and the incentive compatibility framework will be similar to the multi-layer case. Meaning we formulate S tilde according to this equation. Then uh, the moral hazard problem can be mitigated, meaning member loss probabilities will become below uh, the CCP loss probability conditional on the default of the largest member, right? So this essentially gives us a way to say that uh, it may be the case that uh, a monolayer CCP would need to uh, contribute to the default uh, waterfall and, uh, way above the contribution of capital contribution of a multi-layer CCP to the default waterfall. S tilde is M divided by D times S. So we can satisfy the same set of incentive compatibility constraints. Again, M is the total pool of initial margin and D is the uh, pre-funded default fund. Now, uh, just before, uh, before I conclude, uh, uh, what, if, uh, uh, what if we change focus to member-owned CCPs? So if you recall, uh, in our very uh, stylized way to approximate the expected, expected net profit uh, 
of an investor on CCPs, we arrive at this very simple formulation. So the gross profit uh, phi, that's a clearing fee times the average clearing volume over a period of time minus the expected loss from the CCP's perspective. Now here, to extend that to the member owned case, uh, just borrowing ideas, as I mentioned earlier from Hart and Moore, uh, we know that in any market, uh, total surplus can be viewed as the sum of total producer surplus and uh, uh, consumer surplus. So what, this, what does this mean uh, in our setting? In our setting, it means that consider a member-owned CCP and take the view of uh, member I. So part of member I's profit comes from the fact that it's a member of the CCP and it would take a share of the profit of that CCP. Suppose that that CCP would uh, share that profit equally across all these N members. And because in our analysis, everything is conditional on a default of one member, so divided by N minus one. How about the total consumer surplus part? Suppose that this direct clearing member of the CCP clear uh, through the CCP on behalf of its clients, and that generates some uh, private profit for that member, member I. And that would be, this is the uh, clearing volume uh, of member I through the CCP, and that's the profit that gross profit that member I generates minus the expected loss to member I uh, conditional on the default of member J. Now, if you agree that we can augment this uh, expected net profit function in the investor own case, by this one in the member own case, then here we make two observations. One is that this guy uh, can be viewed as an increasing function of S and S tilde, both layers of the skin in the game. This is the loss from CCP managers perspective. In a member owned CCP, CCP managers are people who run the day-to-day -day business of the CCP. This is mem uh, loss uh, from uh, uh, member I's perspective. And it is in fact an, uh, um, a, a decreasing function of S and S tilde. So the first observation is unlike the investor owned case, member-owned CCPs may have some incentives to contribute capital to the default waterfall. And this has been supported by the empirical evidence, for example, captured and documented in the paper by Huang that I, <clears throat> that I, mean, I cited earlier. Yes. Can you give some examples of member-owned CCPs? Are there familiar ones? Uh, DTCC and all its subsidiaries. FIC, What's that FIC. an acronym for, DTCC? Uh, FIC, uh, uh, so FIC is Fixed Income Clearing Corporation. DTCC is uh, uh, so ah, Depository uh, Trust. Depository. Yes, DTCC is the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the second observation, uh, the second observation here is the following. That so in a very simple case, actually I'm making the same assumption that Hart and Moore did uh, in the 1996 paper. Suppose that uh, we are very simple style as assumption. There is a one member, one vote scheme. And suppose that, uh, which is the case in practice, that the membership structure at the CCP is heterogeneous, right? Then take the perspective of member I, it is easy to see that if you go back to the formulation of L tilde J I, that L tilde J I is an increasing function of D I. In words, if member I contributes more to the pre-funded default fund, then member I is more incentivized to ask the CCP managers to contribute more capital to the, uh, to the default waterfall, right? Contrast this member I with a small member where it contributes minimally 
to the pre-funded default fund, uh, pre-funded default fund. So that member may not even care about loss mutualization because its contribution to the default fund is minimal. So if membership is heterogeneous, then we have we may have collected decision making problems because large members by large members I mean meaning I mean members that have large contribution to the default fund they may vote for uh, CCPs holding more capital allocating more capital to the skin in the game and com contrast that to the small contrast that to the uh, small members and the result of this. Uh, collected decision making complication might be having insufficient levels of skin in the game uh, at a member on CCPs. So that's that's our argument for uh, essentially uh, saying that uh, skin in the game may also need to be regulated at uh, at member on CCPs. Just to conclude, uh, uh, the pre uh, the proposed framework is grounded in incentive compatibility constraint that address risk management, what I call risk management agency problems. Uh, 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 as you have seen, uh, SRTG formulations are relatively uh, simple and uh, uh, the input parameter, the date, uh, the, the, uh, the parameters, I mean, some of them are already set by the regulators and, and the rest are available to CCPs and regulators. Here, uh, I would just mention that um, obviously the resilience of CCPs that will be at the center of the US treasury market um, is extremely important. It might be interesting to note that uh, the first recommendation of the G30 report for the re reform of the US treasury market was that the Fed should create a standing repo facility that provides a very broad access to repo financing for US uh, uh, treasury for uh, US treasury securities uh, and it turned out that uh, New York Fed did set up that standing repo facility but it did not give the very broad access uh, to uh, of that facility to market participants and the concern was creating moral hazard problems that would increase systemic risk now, uh, uh, the result of this paper, uh, I think, we think shows that this moral hazard problem can be uh, uh, counteracted when uh, CCP risk management agency problems uh, uh, are mitigated effectively. So uh, before I stop, uh, I, I would just mention here that um, uh, the, the analysis can also, as you may have seen in the paper, extended to uh, the general cover N case. As you know, cover two case is important for uh, systemically important derivative CCPs. The formulations are uh, remain simple in the sense that uh, uh, S and S tilde uh, can be expressed as a fraction of uh, the pre-funded default fund mention numerical examples here uh, uh, here you see one in the appendix and maybe at the very end uh, I would mention this that um, this this research has not been about uh, uh, optimal capital regulation at the CCP so we have not considered the social cost of uh, uh, CCP equity capital so in the paper, we have a short section uh, where uh, we have discussed uh, what, uh, what could be the objective function from the uh, social planners perspective. So here, uh, up to this point, we have uh, this, you can think of the first three terms capturing the CCP's uh, uh, expected uh, net profit. Here, we can think of this as a social cost of CCP's total equity capital. What is CCP's total equity capital? It's S plus S tilde, whatever CCP has allocated to the default waterfall, plus whatever uh, has been left outside of the default waterfall. That is denoted by ES. CS is the uh, social cost of uh, CCP's failure, assuming that uh, CCP's will not fully internalize their own uh, cost of default. Uh, 
and choose the uh, default probability of the CCP. Here, uh, the contribution is revising the objective function of the policymakers. So right now, the existing regulatory regime is that regulators would say, what should the level of ET be? That's the total uh, capital requirement at the CCP. And they are silent about, not fully, but in a risk-based way, they don't say how much S and S tilde should be allocated to the default waterfall. So the revised objective function is that uh, when I mentioned regulating uh, skin in the game, I mentioned in, in this very stylized framework, the social planner would optimize uh, by specifying the optimum level of S, S tilde, and, uh, and ES. And I mentioned that this is not about what we have laid out, is not about optimal capital regulation, again, we, because we have not taken into account what is the social cost of CCP equity cap. Uh, I stop here. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah. Th thanks, I mean, I saw a numerical example go by. Uh, well, yes. Through it. I assume these yeah. are these are in your paper. Yes, that's also in the paper. Yes, that's yeah. essentially that's essentially uh, a snapshot of why uh, we arrived at this conclusion that uh, skinning the game below 15, 20 percent of the total pre-funded default fund cannot be produced in our framework. We vary the level of uh, tail exponent of the Pareto distribution. These are different loss probabilities uh, associated with initial margin, associated with uh, the pre-funded default fund. And that's the target loss probability that you saw in the general formulation of S plus S tilde. Uh -huh. And uh, you can see how S plus S tilde divided by D uh, will vary when we play with these parameters. And uh, it can't really go below 15%. I mean, uh -huh. S plus S still can't go really below 15% of the pre-funded default. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's interesting to see uh, because when I look at this alpha column, I mean, the difference between two and six doesn't sound like a lot, but actually there's a huge difference if you're thinking of those numbers as exponents into the kind of the six exactly. could be almost normal for some intents and purposes, while two... Uh, it doesn't it barely has a variance so exactly. uh those are very different riskinesses yes yes exactly well then i i do encourage everybody to look through these and try and make sense of the numbers i i have a question i'm remembering back to the a, a big crisis in 2008 there was a book called the banker's new clothes or something uh admati and helwig and they also very much emphasize the concept of skin in the game uh, of just banks having equity exposure uh, of mm -hmm. their own, say, same kind of principle. And I'm wondering if that that's influenced your work at all or uh, if you feel uh, there's any connection to it. Uh, yes, and I, I think that, that there is even, I mean, uh, I mean more uh, because of this, what, uh, people often refer to as the loss mutualization, loss mutualization scheme at CCP, which I think is, I mean, to my knowledge, relatively unique to CCPs to some extent, to the insurance industry. I think uh, skin in the game is even, um, I don't want to say it's more important, but seems to be a, a more obvious problem compared to, uh, uh, compared to bank capital regulation. Huh. Okay, thanks. But it's interesting that you say this is unique to CCPs. I, I don't know if you guys are following the Bankman Freed uh, trial or read Michael Lewis's book or other stuff on it, but I, I think I learned that in, in crypto markets, kind of not, nothing really like a CCP, there's losses and thefts, and these are distributed among survivors. It reminded me, at least okay. loosely, of your mutualization process it seemed like the same sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So maybe Thank you. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I'm just as kind of amateur at this, but but uh, certainly. An Thank you. I didn't know that story to follow along.
Um, well, let me open up to uh, others to ask questions. So I've got a question about uh, what it would take to regulate this. So I'm guessing that the regulatory authority is splintered among the Fed, the SEC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and and other possibly other uh, regulators. Is that correct? Uh, um, that they'd all have to take action in order to uh, cover all of the um, uh, uh, clearing CCPs. Um, and, uh, you know, do they have the authority or would it take congressional action in order to do it? So just wondering what your thoughts are about uh, how regulation of this might proceed. Sure. Uh, I think uh, the CFTC, Bob, has authority over uh, regulating systemically important derivative uh, uh, CCPs uh, in the U.S. Uh, part of that is, of course, also with the SEC. So the SEC uh, regulate, uh, supervises uh, 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 self-regulatory uh, uh, CCPs, SROs uh, in the US, both DTCC and Options Clearing Corporation. So Options Clearing Corporation, as you know, it clears uh, uh, equity options and other options. So SCC for uh, OCC and um, ICE Clear Credit, for example, and CME, that's over the jurisdiction of uh, the CFTC. And they have the power to, uh, some power, uh, to uh, to regulate if they if they choose to uh, to regulate skin in the game, and uh, in Europe it's Emir. So in in Emir's framework, for example, um, they have a non risk based uh, way to regulate uh, skin in the game. In under Emir's framework, the idea is that. Uh, uh, here is the CCP's total capital. 25% of that needs to be allocated uh, to the default waterfall. They don't specify, as I mentioned, it, where that 25% uh, has come from. But I think um, Emir has the authority, if they choose to do it, to make this 25% rule uh, a, a risk-based rule for skin in the game. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Any further questions? Hey, Sam, um, I've got a quick, quick comment and a, and a question. Look, thank you so much for um, taking the time to, to walk us through this um, sure. very interesting paper. Um, thank you. I saw you mentioned in the concluding remarks the G30 paper, uh, which I think was led by Tim Geithner. And I think I was also thinking about um, your proposal and some of the concepts you're talking about uh, through the lens of that paper, including because I think there's been some talk of, of um, uh, centrally clearing um, US treasuries to a greater extent than they have been in the past. And that could be, you know, from reading some of Daryl's work, you know, an additional, you know, double, double digit um, trillion worth of additional um, securities being cleared. So I think that the topics that you're focusing on are very relevant and interesting. And then my, my question was, um, have you had a chance to share this concept with uh, someone like LCH or CME at this point? And, and if so, what was their sort of feedback on providing additional transparency on the default waterfall and quantifying this in the game? Thank you, Marcus. So he, uh, on the first part of your comment slash question, yes, I think, I mean, one uh, one of the main proposals at that report was, like you said, like I mentioned at the beginning, broader central clearing mandate of uh, the U.S. Treasury market. SEC has, in fact, come up with a proposal. Uh, uh, I mean, I've been given the opportunity to be among the folks working on the proposal. And if it gets adopted, uh, that would be, uh, we will see a really broad central clearing mandate for both the cash part of the uh, US Treasury market and, uh, uh, and the repo part. But in terms of 
me uh, communicating or Rama communicating these results to CCPs. Uh, uh, I haven't done that. Rama may haven't done that either. So hopefully, hopefully in the future. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, let's thank our speaker. So, I mean, thank you for an awesome thank talk. Thank you, Lisa. Really, thank uh, you, Bob. Beautiful work. I um, can we post the recording and the slides and stuff and your paper on the CDAR website? Sure. Right. Uh, I would be grateful. So, uh, yeah. Great. Everyone can can find it there. Um, sure. Hope to have you out in person uh, next yes. season Look for, uh, for yes. more talk. Yeah, um, looking forward to it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Bob. You. Thanks, everyone. Next, Thanks, uh, before we go, just want to mention that next week, uh, um, at this time, we'll be having Lynn Burks of One Concern, uh, Resilience Analytics to Measure Physical Risk at Scale. So um, looking forward to that and looking forward to seeing many of you there. Thanks, everyone, and have an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Sammy. Thank you, Bye. Sammy. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob.